This video was brought to you by NordVPN, who is giving my audience an enormous discount on a two-year plan plus four more months for free by going to nordvpn.com slash jaysreviews or by using the promo code jaysreviews as seen on screen. In case you're unfamiliar with it, NordVPN is a virtual private network that encrypts your data, like your IP address, your internet history, giving you more privacy and security when using the internet. The best part of the package is that NordVPN allows users to connect to thousands of different servers in 60 countries. And what's great about this is that if you're currently trying to play a game on your computer or binge watch a show on Netflix, Hulu, or any other streaming platform of that kind, and the show gets taken down in your region because of rights issues or whatever else, you can use Nord to bypass said region locking and keep watching your favorite content. Like I said, I achieved this effortlessly using NordVPN, and you guys can get a massive discount and a two-year plan using the first link in the description and the pinned comment, or the promo code JaysReviews. That's one word, all lowercase letters. Like I said, the first link in the description and the pinned comment. Having said that, let's get on with the show. Mega Man X3 is a strange game, one of the strangest I've ever played. When talking about this game, we're talking about a game released for the Super Nintendo in late 1995 and early 1996. The fifth console generation was already on its way, and we have this game in the less advanced hardware. This game, which was released after Mega Man 7, the 16-bit continuation of the classic series, confirming that classic Mega Man wasn't going anywhere. These two could coexist at the same time, paving the way for more Mega Man subseries to be released alongside the classic and X games. X3 of any X game is the one with the most versions released, each with their own unique elements that we'll dive into later. Mega Man X3 is most certainly the worst of the 16-bit Mega Man X games for several reasons that shall be explored before this video is done. But with that said, Mega Man X3 is another one of my favorite games ever made, just like X1, X2, and X4. Spoilers for the X4 review, I guess. But anyway, that's what we're here to explore today. Mega Man X3 is a strange game, one that I love to death. So without further ado, Let's discuss the imperfect perfection of Mega Man X3. Similar to X2, X3 opens up with a backstory. Only, this one goes on a little too long and isn't that exciting, but regardless, the year is 21XX and a major change has taken place. A reploid scientist named Dr. Doppler created a cure for the Maverick virus, which I guess the games haven't really specified up to this point, but many Mavericks go Maverick because of a computer virus. Alternatively called the Sigma virus, since that floating head thing is the embodiment of it. Dr. Doppler's achievement causes a town to be built in his honor called Doppeltown. But Dr. Doppler turns evil and now has eight new Mavericks under his command as he launches an all-out assault on Maverick Hunter HQ as Mega Man X and Zero need to rush back and defend it. This intro stage is another fantastic one for all the same reasons as the previous games, but the standout moment is when X gets captured by a fellow Maverick Hunter turned Maverick, and to save him, you finally get to play a Zero for the first time who obliterates this guy in one Z-Saber swing, plus a couple of extra bullets. But the functionality of Zero is something we can get back to way later in the video. Once the stage is over, X and Zero need to head into Doppeltown, defeat the eight Mavericks working for Doppler before taking on the Mad Scientist himself. Two stages in, you'll see that Dr. Doppler sends out Bit, Bite, and Vile Mark II to fight against you, and that, surprise, Sigma is behind the whole thing. But again, these are all things we can get back to later. By X3, you should be familiar with the formula. We have eight new Mavericks to face, and you pick them in any order. In X2, I talked about the game adding the dash to X's default moveset and the impact that had in the level design. In X3, when asked about what has changed when it comes to playing as X between games, the answer to that is genuinely nothing. X has no abilities or buffs at the start of X3 that he didn't have in X2. Although the dashing damage boost has been nerfed to no longer work on bosses, but still works on enemies. I guess that's a change. While nothing has changed about playing as X himself, that's not to say there's nothing unique about Mega Man X3, because this game tried to up the ante in numerous ways. But to start simple, let's discuss the level design. Originally, I was going to say that this game's level design was a total downgrade from the previous games, because this game doesn't really have much in the way of the set pieces that X1 and X2 had, especially X2, since that game had the dash at default. It's definitely true that X3's level design is much more straightforward than X2, since there'll be many segments of you just going forward and trying to blast whatever stands in your way. But when looking at the level maps of X3, I think there was serious potential here. I think the most well-designed level in X3 is Toxic Seahorses stage. The first big moment of the level is this vertical shaft where you have to dash jump between the walls to make it to the top. Along the way, there will be these enemies positioned on the opposite side of the wall you need to deal with, and enemies in the air to get in your way while also dealing with the rushing water coming from the sewer pipes. I think this area is the peak of X3's level design as it takes advantage of the X-Series gameplay pretty well. The rest of the stage is also really good as the mid portion has two paths, one that you need a ride armor for and the other you can just run along the ground of. 
But in many other stages in X3, verticality is not put to good use. Like in Blast Hornet stage, Gravity Beetle stage, or Volt Catfish's stage where there is verticality but you just have to ride elevators up and down. This can be bypassed with the leg parts of the third armor, but I'll get into that in a moment. Other than that, you just have to stand there and wait. I think many stages in this game have good moments, like the conveyor belts of Blast Hornet, the ending set piece of Blizzard Buffalo where the storm is affecting your control, but you can knock it out by destroying the storm machine. And I like the ending of Volt Catfish where you have to carefully move around the electric panels and the enemies. Or this part of Crush Crawfish where you have to blast the generator of the ship that turns the whole thing on its side and you have to climb up the area. My point is there are a lot of highs in X3's level design, the game just doesn't take advantage of every opportunity to do something interesting like X1 and especially X2 did. Then there's a smaller problem with X3 needing you to take leaps of faith and just hope enemies won't be waiting for you, or worse, spikes or something like that. So the level design is overall a mixed bag, but then there's the item game, probably the most important part of a Mega Man X for me. X3 is a very complicated game in this respect. As usual, you have the four sub tanks to find and heart tanks and four new armor pieces. The third armor, where the leg parts are the best the series has seen thus far. It allows you to air dash like an X2, but now you can dash upwards as well. Just by saying that, I'm sure you can imagine the ways in which it would be useful. The arm parts still allow you to charge up your special weapons and you get an extra charge shot, but this one's not nearly as good as X2. Here, you can still fire two charge blasts, but if they combine, then you get this screen wave thing that doesn't do nearly the amount of damage on bosses that X2's charge shot did. Also, is it just me, or does this arm cannon look like a vacuum to anyone else? The body parts reduce the damage you take, and when you do take damage, a shield is released around you that further protects you. And lastly, you have the head parts. This displays a map of the stage upon starting that shows you the locations of secrets. Now this, I think, is interesting. Since they've been trying their best with each game to give these head parts a useful function, this is their best attempt thus far, however it does have problems. I mainly don't like the fact that you can only see the map when starting a stage. That, and it's hard to say where you are in relation to these red blinking squares. Here's what I think they should have done. The SNES's X button does not do anything during any of these games, so maybe if you pressed it when you got the head parts that would stop the action and release the map and it would have a blinking blue square which shows your location in relation to the collectibles. I think that's a great solution that would make the head parts much better than it is now. Besides the map, you can also see which items are located in the stage on the world map, which is a very handy thing I'd imagine. But here's where things get tricky. X3 still has 10 more collectibles, now that we've gone over the usual suspects. Let's start with the four ride armors. Those beefy, walking, punching tank things from X1 and X2. In those games you'd find them, you'd punch some stuff, and that would be it. Now you collect them and you can use them in stages. The Chimera armor is the same as the one from X1, you can dash around and punch. The Kangaroo armor is like the one in X2 with a charged attack, only it can't fly now. Instead, the Hawk armor can fly and has rockets on board. The Frog armor being one that can traverse underwater, and nowhere else, basically. This is required for the higher route in the underwater portion of Toxic Seahorse's stage that I mentioned earlier. So you can choose one of four ride armors when these capsules show up. Now what's wrong with this, you might ask? Well, the baffling design choice that you can collect the last three I mentioned, but you can't use any of them until you find the Chimera armor in Blast Hornet stage. Why would they do this? I just cannot think of a single reason to design it like this, as it limits the freedom and the exploration of the game for no good reason. To be honest, I don't even really use these when they come up, I just collect them because you have to. But if that seems convoluted, then you have the enhancement chips where things really stop making sense. So there are the four parts of the third armor we talked about, but then the other four stages house pink Doctor Light capsules, each one enhances one part of X's armor. The head parts allow you to regain health while standing still, the body parts further reduce damage, the arm parts give you the hyper cannon where you can shoot charge shots without charging, and the leg parts allow you to double dash. As in, you can air dash and then upward air dash. It's actually pretty useful. All of these are actually pretty cool, but you can only use one at a time. This isn't the end of the world, but then you get the first Doppler stage where if you collect all eight heart tanks, all four sub tanks, all four ride armors, all four regular light capsules, and don't collect any enhancement ship, you can jump down to this pit at full health and you'll find the golden armor which grants X all four enhancement chips. Now this is an interesting system on paper. You can take the short term benefits or wait for long term benefits. Not a bad idea, but the game just does not communicate this to you at all. Making the golden armor something that most players would just never find without a guide, especially since the map thing from the head parts doesn't even work in the Doppler stages. The game design in X3 is just ass backwards, as you can probably tell with all these new systems that don't really get fleshed out and are poorly explained. Another one of these things would be Zero as a playable character. In the pause menu, you can press R and then select Zero as the player character, however he's just not that good. His health bar is bigger than X's, but so is his hitbox, making him a bigger target with slower movement. X is better for just about everything. 
Now you might say, but Zero's bigger health bar and powerful Z Saber surely must be useful for bosses, right? Well, Zero can't fight bosses, or even mini bosses for that matter, because X will just say, I'll take this one, Zero, and then the game will force you back into being X. Once the mini boss is done, you can't even switch back to being Zero, it's one time per stage. If Zero was put in to be a pure novelty rather than a functioning gameplay element, I guess I must say job well done, but I just think that doesn't make any sense because Zero is basically useless since he can't collect anything, can't fight any bosses, and when he dies, you can never select him again. I just don't know where they were coming from with a lot of these decisions. I was on the subject of bosses a moment ago, which brings us into that conversation. Honestly, I think many of the bosses in this game have interesting patterns. You'll get a Tonal Rhino who just rams back and forth, and a Blizzard Buffalo who spends a lot of the fight off screen, but others like Gravity Beetle and Blast Hornet will have these attacks that are pretty fun to dodge while dealing with the boss themselves, like when Gravity Beetle fires two Gravity Wells on screen they need to time your wall clings alongside. However, the problem is that the boss attacks are very readable. I mean, super predictable. So to combat the bosses all being really easy, the damage output from basically everything in X3 is super high at the start. This is what allows a boss like Gravity Beetle to kick your ass. If you make the smallest of screw-ups, you'll probably lose most of your starting health bar. Seriously, a boss like Neon Tiger has some really slow-ass animations and wind-ups, but if you get hit by him, you're basically screwed. Of course, once you throw weaknesses into the mix, then all the difficulty goes out the window. But that was only one example. Almost all of them are like this. You know my stance on this, it's just extremely broken. Like I said, if a weakness makes your win a literal guarantee regardless of how much health you have, then I think there's a problem. Why even fight the boss at all at that point? But I will say this, the special weapons in this game are fantastic. Offensively, you have weapons like Triad Thunder or Spinning Blade which tears in enemies with massive damage, and defensively you have weapons like Frost Shield which makes enemies drop health in the SNES version of the game, and a weapon like Parasitic Bomb which holds enemies in place allowing you to slip past them. But I'm getting off topic here. The sheer amount of collectibles in this game might make you wonder what the least backtracking route in X3 looks like. Back in 2015, this was actually the hardest one to figure out because I could identify ways in which you could do it, but then it was a matter of execution. The run goes like this. Tunnel Rhino, Blizzard Buffalo, Blast Hornet, Neon Tiger, Toxic Seahorse, Gravity Beetle, Volt Catfish, and Crush Crawfish with you having to backtrack to Tunnel Rhino for the upgrades you missed in his stage, then collecting the Gold Armor and Doppler 1. There actually is some room for variety here because you could do Neon Tiger 3rd and even Toxic Seahorse 4th, but this one just works the best for me. In 2015, the challenge with this run was that you had to beat Blast Hornet and Neon Tiger without weaknesses, and even Tunnel Rhino as a starting boss might give you some trouble. I am very, very used to them all now. But still, I really spammed the Wii U's restore points system when I was trying to learn these bosses because they hit like a truck, which potentially could jeopardize the whole thing. But on the flip side, they also made this my favorite one to do. In this case, I was overcoming a great challenge by figuring out X3, transforming this game from one I did not like at all in my first run into one of my favorites. But that story can wait for the end of the video. This game being one of the main reasons I wanted to do the least backtracking runs of these games because the weakness run of X3 is a madhouse. For this video, I did several runs of this game. When I did the run on the PlayStation version, I did the weakness order that begins at Blizzard Buffalo. By the end of this run, you have to backtrack to several stages in order to pick up some tiny collectibles you missed, like the Heart Tank and Gravity Beetle, the Ride Armor and Toxic Seahorse, the Body Parts and Volt Catfish, the Ride Armor and Crush Crawfish, and the list goes on and on. The amount of time you spend on this is so worthless that I tried to come up with something different. And here we are today. When actually collecting stuff in X3, there's another problem. The game doubles down on X1 needing a particular upgrade from any later ones when X2 allows you to get almost everything without some other upgrade. In X3, you start with Tunnel Rhino in my route, because you need his weapon to get the Heart Tank in Blizzard Buffalo's stage, which is where the foot parts are. You need both of those things to get the arm parts in Neon Tiger's stage, which is then required to get the body armor in Volt Catfish's stage. His weapon is then required to get some other upgrades. The game uses the same items repeatedly to get multiple upgrades, and at that, getting these often feels very arbitrary. Like the heart tank and head parts in Tunnel Rhino's level that are gotten via smashing the ground with a charged Triad Thunder when the thing in your way is a rock held by a rope. Wouldn't you think Spinning Blade would do the job better? Or even Acid Burst? I don't know who would think of this. Or the heart tank and Gravity Beetle. It's blocked by these crates, but if you simply beat Blast Hornet's stage, it just won't be there. That's what I'm talking about. Super arbitrary stuff like that affects the design of X3.
Now that we're about halfway through the video, you might be wondering how the title could be true with all that I've said, and all I will say is that the conclusion will explain everything. In the meantime, let's get back to the game and talk about something else I brought up at the beginning. The fact that there are a bunch of different versions of this game as well. At the top, I mentioned that X3 was a game for the Super Nintendo released in 1995 or 96, depending on the region. This was around the time of the jump to the next console generation, the PlayStation, Sega Saturn, and Nintendo 64. Although that last one doesn't really matter here. Capcom decided to release Mega Man X3 on the PlayStation 1 in 1996 in Japan and 1997 in Europe. An American port was apparently planned but never saw the light of day. In terms of what had changed, in regards to gameplay, absolutely nothing. Mega Man X3 on the PlayStation is the same game it was in the Super Nintendo. What has changed are the little cosmetic details. First, the game uses the technology to have better graphical effects like a higher degree of transparency on this water or these clouds. And they implemented FMVs in place of the opening, a cutscene before the intro stage, a cutscene showcasing the Maverick you're about to fight before their stage, and other cutscenes at the end of the game. Besides that, they replaced the entire soundtrack with a CD Redbook version. In terms of music, I know this is a hot take, but X3 is absolutely top tier for me in both versions. Starting with the SNES soundtrack, it absolutely is up my alley. Many have complained that I love the X3 music but give a lot of heat to the soundtrack of Mega Man Zero Four 4 on the Game Boy Advance. I don't really feel like I'm contradicting myself here, I just think the GBA didn't have the tech to do Zero Four's music any justice. But with X3, I think the instrumentation works for me because of how it can mix in these high-pitched sounds as well as the low-pitched ones. So I don't really get annoyed by any of the sounds in this game, I just enjoy the entire soundtrack in spite of how criminally short the loops are. The soundtrack on PlayStation 1 is equally good. For X3, you'd expect the music to all be headbanging guitars, but the PS1 music often doesn't take that approach, leading to an interesting sound across the board, while still producing bangers for the likes of Toxic Seahorse. Now Doppler Stage 1's remix is a crime against humanity, but other than that, I really like the music here. But if you really want some banging Mega Man X3 remixes, amongst other Mega Man tracks, check out Lenny Letterman. I've been a subscriber of his for almost a year now, and his remixes never fail to impress me, so really, check them out if you haven't. Anyway, the PlayStation 1 was not the only console to receive X3. Said PlayStation port was also released for the Sega Saturn in Japan and Europe. This one actually got some pretty bad scores, but when I played it, I was kind of surprised it wasn't really doing anything terrible that the other ports of X3 weren't doing. Well. Ignore that jittering X on the screen, I always assumed that was my emul console screwing up the graphics. I always heard that the Saturn port was super slow, but I can only conclude that it must be the European version running at 50 Hz, because the Japanese version ran just fine. The Saturn version does add these tacky borders on the top of the game, and that's because X3, as an SNES game, was natively 8x7, something the PlayStation was able to handle, as well as other bizarre aspect ratios like in the Crash games. Your CRT would then just stretch the image into the regular aspect ratio. The Saturn didn't have that capacity to handle different aspect ratios, I guess, so they put a border in to fill the space. The Saturn version does have a save feature though, so that's neat. Said save feature made its way into the Windows 95 version of X3, the 5th gen version of X3 that actually did reach the states, and I even own a copy of it. I can't play it at the moment since my current PC doesn't have a disk drive, but like I said, it comes with the save feature and an easy mode that lessens the damage you take from enemies and bosses. The weirdest version of X3 is this bootleg version of it that got released on the Genesis and... Oh, God. Every time I revisit this as a joke, I always forget just how puke-inducing this version of X3 is, so forget I said anything. The 5th gen version of X3 was given mainstream access to Western players when it got included in the PS2's Mega Man X collection, which is how I first experienced this version. And the typo in the Blizzard Buffalo cutscene where his name got spelled Bilzard Buffalo. Other than that, there's nothing really to say about it because it's just the PlayStation version in America. The 2018 Mega Man X Legacy collection included the SNES version though, so if it matters to you which X3 you play, I figured I'd mention that. But last, and certainly not least, is Mega Man X3 The Zero Project, a ROM hack of the game developed by xjustin 3009 x I've been singing the praises of The Zero Project for years now, and what's great is that the project has only gotten better since 2016 when I did the original X3 review. The final release came out a couple years back, and I have no problem saying it is absolute perfection. 
What the Zero Project offered before was a version of this game where Zero was a fully implemented playable character who can fight bosses, collect heart tanks, and Dr. Light capsules and all that. Now, many more changes have been made to make this the definitive X3 experience, as Zero can no longer use Light Capsules to keep in continuity with later games, but he does start with a double jump and the ability to smash these rocks in Tunnel Rhino with his Z Saber. This completely blows the item game of X3 wide open. Because of this, you no longer need to backtrack to Tunnel Rhino stage at the end of the game, and, in fact, you can get the head parts as the first armor piece. The head parts have been adjusted as well so that they reduce the amount of special weapon ammo that X uses per shot when for Zero it's doubled at default. So they really highlight the fact that Zero starts more powerful than X, but X becomes way more powerful by the end. From Tunnel Rhino stage, you can then go to Neon Tiger's level and get the arm parts via Zero's double jump. Look at this. X can't achieve this at all in the original game. X's arm part charge shot is faster and more fun to use, some items are given more fun ways of getting, the right armors can be used after collecting one, regardless of whether or not you found the Chimera armor first. It's improvements like that which allow you to just enjoy X3 more than you ever could in any other version. The Zero Project is a perfect Mega Man X game, and I have no problem saying that. Showing how close X3 is to being that. But the game just fumbles on its new ideas, but luckily a fan was able to step in and give us such a perfect rendition of X3, even including a save feature and a new Game Plus option. I cannot recommend the Zero Project of X3 enough, it's fantastic. Kind of a shame the X2 version got cancelled, but I understand why. He had been doing the X3 project for years and probably just got burned out, I imagine. Although it is funny. What was done for the Zero Project of X2 got released, and I actually played it as soon as it did. I forget how far back this was. And this is actually what taught me how dumb my raging at X2 for not having a reward for beating the X Hunters was. I mean, it's playable Zero, which is nice, but it doesn't really change much about X2 and it shows you there wasn't much to change. The game was pretty damn cool already. Back to the main game. You know the drill. We've done all the stages, gotten all the upgrades, it's time for the final levels. Doppler's Fortress in the center of Doppeltown. I already let the cat out of the bag on the first one of these Doppler levels housing the Golden Armor. The Zero Project allowing Zero to gain access to his Black Armor from here, like the Ultimate Armor Capsule in X5. At the end of the stage, you get one of two bosses. If you killed Bit and Bite in the Maverick stages, you fight this boss in the garbage disposal. But if you didn't kill Bit and Bite, they team up in a new form. But I guess that begs the discussion of Bit and Bite, though. Throughout X3, you'll find these empty boss rooms, and the purpose of them is that this is where Bit and Bite will try to jump you. It's not totally random how this happens. Bit will be the one you face first, in any of your third, fourth, or fifth stages. So on my route, any stage between Blast Hornet and Toxic Seahorse. Bite will then do the same one of the last three stages you play. To beat them, you just need to use the X Buster, but that will cause them to run away. To kill them, you need to use one of their two weaknesses, Frost Shield or Triad Thunder for Bit, Tornado Fang or Ray Splasher for Bite. In the Zero Project, it actually is random which one of them you'll face, but if you play any one of Tunnel Rhino, Blizzard Buffalo, Volt Catfish, or Neon Tiger as your first two stages, you'll have the firepower needed to finish either one of them off. These two don't affect the game like the X Hunters did, which is a bit of a shame, since like I said in the last video, I thought that system added a lot to the game in terms of risk versus reward and exploration. Here, it's just another system to throw into the X3 mix. But then you get Stage 2, where there are two versions of this level. If you beat Vile Mark 2 in the Maverick stages, then you get this clean Doppler Stage 2 with the toughest enemies in the game. But if you don't, the stage is trashed and you have to fight Vile here. I usually don't bother facing Vile in the Maverick stages because I think it's more climactic to fight him at the end of the game. But if you do, Vile is hidden in secret spots throughout the game, and when you find his secret capsule, you get warped to his area where you will then fight him. Same rules from Bit and Bite apply. Use his weakness, Ray Splasher, to kill him. Otherwise, he'll run away when his health bar is depleted. Either way, you have to then escape the area before it explodes. Why this matters now is for what might be the most convoluted item unlock in Mega Man history. X1 and X2 had these Street Fighter superpower moves that killed bosses in one hit. X3 has a superpower move, but instead of a Street Fighter technique, it's Zero's Z Saber. To get this, you have to first kill Vile in the Maverick stages, then you need to make sure Zero is alive, so never use him, reach Doppler 2, make it to this mini-boss door, switch to Zero, then battle the mini-boss as him. If you die, Zero is gone, just like the rest of the game, but if you win, Zero gets battle damaged and gives you his Z Saber, which kills bosses in two hits when you fully charge your buster. Recall what I said before, this game is ass backwards. I suppose this isn't more convoluted than the Hadouken in X1, but there's just so many steps here that are completely unrelated. And then asking you to fight a mini-boss as Zero is ridiculous when the whole game has been telling you it can't be done. I really have no idea how anyone was supposed to find this without Nintendo Power or whatever. 
Although props to the Zero Project again, at this point in that game, if you meet all these conditions and try to walk into this boss door as Zero, X will give you a warning to be careful just to remind players who might have forgotten that the Z Saber is still in the game, and is still gotten the same way. I usually skip past this upgrade since it gives you the bad ending and I like getting the best ending if I can. At the end of Doppler 2, you have what belongs in the list of worst Mega Man segments. This snail segment where you have to wait on robot snails that will take you up this shaft. Need I say more? I get you can easily get past it if you just master neon jumping, but I won't be doing that. After the one time I spent like an hour trying to do iceless jumps in Boomer Kawanger stage in X1, I gave up on the speedrunning strats. As I was saying, I usually don't get the Z Saber, and you really feel it in this awful boss rush stage where you have to refight these long battles and watch their long explosion animations. Which reminds me, this game is a real hard on for those damn explosions. Now even mini bosses take 15 seconds to explode. But once that drag ends, you fight Doppler who reveals Sigma controlled everything and then he's got a new battle body. And the story of this game is a complete nothing burger. I mean, really, nothing happens in X3 of any particular consequence, so... The final boss segment is pretty infamous. The first phase is actually pretty fun to do on a Buster only run as you can clearly tell there's a pattern to his attacks, they just move too fast to dodge. But the strat is to cling up to the wall until his third to last shot where you jump down, avoid the last two blasts and get a charge shot in, repeat until you win. Or just cheese it with the spinning blade. The final boss is the real challenge as Sigma will drain your sub tanks even with all the unlockables you have at this point since everything from the missiles to the bombs to the lasers just hits well, like an X3 boss. Worst part being how you need to shoot him at this precise angle or else the shots won't do any damage. As if this wasn't enough, you then need to escape a rising fire sequence, and if you fail because of a cheap shot from Sigma, you need to do the whole thing again with no sub-tanks. However, if you make it out, you get one of two endings. If Zero is left alive, he will destroy the Sigma virus, but if not, the Dr. Doppler will do it. Either way, the text of the ending is the same. I love the music here, it's really melancholic. Don't have anything to say on the ending itself, since it pretty much is the same thing as the last two games. Just now, it sets up some kind of X versus Zero fight for a later game. And that was Mega Man X3. What I find so interesting about this game is that, as stated at the top of the video, this is one of my favorite games of all time, and yet here we are, reviewing it for the second time, and almost nothing has changed from the original review. I think X3 is the opposite side of the coin from X2. At the end of the X2 review that just came out, I said that X2 is a game that got unfairly maligned by me in 2016 thanks to my incredibly bad attitude towards making videos at the time. In the X3 review, I said this. But the, the foundation, foundation it was built on was very perfect, strong, so by no so means is Mega Man X3 a poorly, poorly designed game. game. Far from it, the game just has problems that cannot be ignored, and I believe I'm a competent enough reviewer to segregate how much fun I have while playing a game from the actual quality of the design. Like I said, little about this has changed. In both that review and this one, I don't wish to tell people why Mega Man X games are fun to play because I've already laid that groundwork in the X1 review, both of them. So saying any of that again would be redundant to say the least. Instead, we're left with what's unique about Mega Man X3, and in that case, I just think most of these systems don't really work, like enhancement chips, ride armors, all that sort of stuff. They crammed a lot of mechanics in this game, and most of the new ones just aren't very good, despite the fact that the game is at its core fun because it's a Mega Man X game. So regardless of the attitude I carry into videos now, X3 still comes out in an unfavorable position from a scripting standpoint. But here is where the difference lies between the two videos. Mr. Analytical over there thought he was being smart by casting aside the emotional stuff and just roasting X3 for its faults. It's a difference in attitude, like I said. I have absolutely zero shame in saying that I love Mega Man X3 because guess what? I don't care that this game has enhancement chips that are designed in an odd fashion or that you need the Chimera armor to use any ride armors because I already know all that stuff so my playthrough is not affected by it at all. It's not just a case of my having played it so many times that I'm numb to the flaws. What it really is, is that I know all of these problems, but in the case of X3, this game means a lot more to me than I could properly explain. But I will try, and I will try to do it briefly since I don't really want to recount that many details. When I got into the Mega Man X series in 2015, it was 8th grade. By that point, I'd say I was liked by most people around me, however, I didn't keep that many close friends. I'd say I had two people who I talked to more than anybody else. If you watched my video, Why I Stopped Making Mega Man Videos, you'd know this story already. One of those friends stopped talking to me completely. 8th grade shit, what can I say? Like I said in the aforementioned video, it really did a number on me at the time though. My other best friend was super busy at the time, so I couldn't hang out with him either. What I chose to turn to was the Mega Man series, and in particular replaying the X games I already got into. I remember that after my first playthroughs of X1 through X5, I decided that every run was going to use cheats and passwords to unlock everything from the start. And I'd have a grand old time. But then one day, I decided I wanted to go further with it. I actually wanted to learn how to 100% the games for myself. 
It was in that moment where I tore up the paper I had all the passwords written on because I was never going to use them again. This is where my interest in least backtracking runs started, but like I said, X3 was the most rewarding because it was also the most difficult. It felt great. I had uncovered the secret to X3, a game that like I said, a game I really didn't like at first but had grown on me through all of this. But all my favorite YouTubers still don't like it though, so I've got to tell the world about this. Then everyone will enjoy the game as much as I do. I can't speak for everyone here, but for myself, as a 14-year-old content consumer, you want your favorite YouTubers to share all of your opinions because then they can convince everyone else to think like you. When they don't, you want them to see it your way. This led to an embarrassing moment in 2015 that I still cringe at the thought of to this day. Looking back on this almost seven years later, it's interesting how things turn out. I kind of get that same vibe from 2000 Sonic fans in my comments who feel betrayed by my not giving them the Colors and Generations rant videos they wanted. I can only imagine with all the buildup I put into bashing those two games, people felt let down by my just having a change of heart and not wanting to do it anymore. But here's my message to everyone. This is why I tell people to just make their own videos, because it's completely free to do. When I started doing YouTube, my attitude on a lot of things had changed, including this nonsense about hoping YouTubers would think like me, because I don't need to do that. I mean, I hope I would have stopped acting like an annoying 14 year old without YouTube, but still, my point is that I'll use my own platform to spread my own thoughts out there. And that's what I've been doing, for better or for worse, since 2015. My opinions not being represented in videos online is what got me fired up to really want to do it myself. And now I have 100k subscribers. Thanks for that, genuinely, to all the people who continue to watch these videos. And you can do it too. Maybe your channel won't blow up overnight, but I'm just saying, if you have a passion for sharing your opinions like I have since I was like two years old, then start doing it. It's free. Anyway, I can never dislike Mega Man X3. Or say anything bad about it in general conversation because this is one of the most important games in my life. It got me through a really bad depressive episode. It and the other X games taught me an important lesson when going from content consumer to content creator. And it has kept bringing me entertainment, and you guys I suppose, for the years that have come after that. Which is why I love Mega Man X3, even though if I were to review it a million times, it would always turn out like this because this game is very flawed. It's imperfect, but it's perfect for me. It's imperfect. Perfection. As always, I'd like to thank the patrons who make this video possible. The tier 2 patrons are getting their names displayed on the screen right now, and the tier 3 patrons pay extra to get their names read out loud. Those being Caleb Escobar, Chris Delgado, Hazel Zero, R in the Atom, Peregree, The Squeaker Nerd, Protector of Memes, Daxter A. Velencourt, Jepson 2.0, Keiko Blur, Kyler Lehman, Bo Blocks, Joe, Michael Caboose, Ya Boy Joe, Avatar Aiden YT, Icarus 10032, The G Wizard, It's Time to Sue, Uriel Moody, 8 Bit Bio, and Myopa Game. Thanks again.